from base editing. Now, when we looked at the animal's lifespan, uh, we were initially disappointed when uh, adenine base editor treatment only modestly extended SMA mouse lifespan. But then we realized that uh, SMA mice have an unusually short time window for treatment uh, of about only six days for correction before the fate of motor neurons is sealed. And that very short window likely limited the ability of base editing to actually exert a therapeutic benefit because we've known from our previous work, such as the progeria work I showed you, that AEV delivery of base editors typically takes maybe one to three weeks for most of the base editing to take place. Now, in human patients, the window for treatment that benefits SMA patients is much longer, up to about one year. So we then put all this together and, and uh, speculated that a simple co-administration of a single dose of nusinersen, the SMA antisense oligonucleotide, along with the base editor AAV, would likely extend this therapeutic window to give the base editor a greater opportunity to correct uh, uh, the, the mutation and would also uh, more closely resemble the state of SMA patients in a clinical trial, since we presume all of them are going to be on one of these SMA drugs. And indeed, the one-time co-administration in vivo of nusinersen and the base editor together as a combination therapy greatly extended animal lifespan from a median of 17 days untreated to now a median of 77 days along with substantial rescue of motor function in behavioral assays, such as how long can you hang on to an inverted screen, or the time that the mouse needs to right itself from being uh, laid on its back. So here's a video of a writing reflex assay for an untreated SMA mouse at, uh, 11, at 14 days of age. And you can see that uh, these mice struggle to, to right themselves uh, when you lay them on their back, and some of them uh, will never right themselves. In contrast, uh, here are videos of uh, adenine base editor treated SMA mice at 14 days of age, also showing substantial rescue of uh, the writing ability. And in the lower right, this is an example of an SMA mouse co injected once with the adenine base editor and nusinersen at 200 days old, uh, well beyond the median lifespan of this SMA mouse model, even following early intervention with Solgensma as well as, uh, for comparison, a healthy heterozygous uh, litter mate shown in the upper right here. Now, the beautiful work of many scientists in other academic labs and in industry have advanced base editing into primates and then into clinical trials. Uh, Kieran Musunura's group and scientists at Verve Therapeutics and Beam Therapeutics recently reported the one-time LMP-mediated uh, delivery of adenine-base editor mRNA, uh, not unlike the COVID vaccine that you guys got, into the liver of non-human primates, resulting in precise mutation of the PCSK9 splice site. Even though their goal was to simply lower PCSK9 levels, and therefore they could in principle do so by disrupting PCSK9 using a nuclease, they actually compared side by side Cas9 nuclease and base editors and chose base editors due to their observation of both higher efficacy and fewer undesired outcomes. So the LMP-mediated ABE delivery durably reduced, permanently reduced, PCSK9 levels in monkeys by 90% and consequently uh, cut LDL cholesterol levels by 60% to treat hypercholesterolemia. So this is a one-time permanent uh, injection that uh, lowers LDL cholesterol by almost two-thirds. Uh, there are four base editing clinical trials, at least, that are now underway in four countries. Uh, last spring, Wasim Kwasim's team um, at the UCL in the UK treated the very first patient in a base editing clinical trial using multiplex base edited CAR T cells to treat T cell leukemia. In late 2021, FDA granted uh, IND clearance for the first US uh, base editing clinical trial, which uses an adenine base editor to install naturally occurring mutations in fetal hemoglobin genes that uh, uh, restore fetal hemoglobin uh, expression first discovered through human genetics because there are some people who uh, should have beta thalassemia or sickle cell disease but don't because despite their homozygous uh, defective beta globin genes, they happen to have won the genetic lottery and, and uh, have additional mutations in their fetal hemoglobin that allow persistence of fetal hemoglobin expression. And in late uh, 2022, the first patients were dosed in an in vivo base editing clinical trial 
Uh, that's uh, the PCSK9 trial I described already uh, in monkeys to treat familiar hypercholesterolemia. So this very rapid progress, uh, where it was only about six years from the very first base editing report to the first use in people, uh, is a testament to the work of thousands of laboratories that have used an advanced base editing uh, resulting in thousands of publications uh, that include base editing. So last December, the, the very first clinical readout from a base editing therapeutic was announced. Uh, this is Alyssa, a then 13-year-old girl in the UK with T-cell leukemia. And she was given a very poor prognosis after both chemotherapy and a bone marrow transplant uh, failed to treat her cancer. She was infused with CAR T-cells that were triply base edited. They contained uh, base edits in CD7, CD52, and the T-cell receptor. Collectively, these edits enabled uh, the, the CAR T-cells to go after uh, Alyssa's cancer without going after her healthy cells and also not committing fratricide, not killing each other, because after all, these are T-cells. Uh, and following uh, treatment with the triply base edited T-cells, Alyssa's uh, T-cell leukemia went into complete remission and as of this month, almost one year after treatment, her cancer remains undetected. And Wasim's team has actually treated other T-cell leukemia patients in this trial as well with uh, positive outcomes. So base editors can make targeted transition mutations in cells, animals, and patients. But what about pathogenic mutations other than transition mutations? These other mutations, the transversions, deletions, insertions, account for about 70% of known pathogenic gene variants. So we sought to develop other methods to directly install or correct these other kinds of changes, again, without requiring double-strand breaks or donor DNA templates. So to enable precise gene editing beyond the mutations that can be installed by base editing, we developed prime editing. Prime editors are fusions of programmable NICases with specially engineered reverse transcriptases. They use an engineered prime editing guide RNA, or PEG RNA for short, shown in green here, that not only specifies the target site for editing, but it also encodes uh, the desired edit. Prime, editing, uh, prime editors nick the target DNA site, and then they use the three prime end of the freshly nicked DNA strand to prime reverse transcription of an extension on the PEG RNA that serves as a reverse transcriptase template and also has an engineered primer binding site to sort of line everything up. The engineered reverse transcriptase domain of the prime editor then copies the desired edit directly onto the target DNA strand, creating a three prime flap of edited DNA that the cell resolves into a heteroduplex containing one edited strand and one non-edited strand. The PE3 system then nicks the non-edited strand to cause the cell to remake that strand using the edited strand as a template thereby completing the conversion of uh, both DNA strands uh, permanently. And since the PEG RNA's reverse transcriptase template here, which encodes the edit, uh, is specified by you, you can make virtually any small substitution, insertion, or deletion using this strategy. Um, currently, the size limit for state-of-the-art prime editing systems is about a couple hundred base pairs for an insertion. Uh, and uh, several hundred base pairs for a deletion. A hallmark of prime editing is this remarkable versatility. So you can now perform uh, for the first time, at least when we reported this for the first time, all 12 possible types of DNA substitutions, as well as precise targeted deletions and precise insertions for the first time in a million cells without requiring double-strand breaks or donor DNA templates. More than 95% of known pathogenic substitutions, insertions, and deletions are fewer than 50 base pairs in length, and thus are well within the size range for installation or correction with prime editing. An important aspect of prime editing is that its edited products tend to be quite homogeneous. In the examples shown here, uh, prime editing can install this three base insertion in the human genome at a target site. And as you can see here, the vast majority of the resulting edited DNA sequences has the desired correction. The slide actually shows all of the DNA sequences, uh, sequencing reads that were observed at 0.2% or greater frequency. In contrast, you can use a Cas9 nuclease and an HDR template to install in the same cells the exact same insertion. And in cells that do support HDR, like the K562 cells on the right, you can get reasonably efficient HDR but in both cases, whether the cells are HDR amenable or not, the predominant 
uh, product are, are these uncontrolled mixtures of indels, which are usually lumped into one percent nuclease editing bar, but are actually a mixture of genotypes that can each have different biological consequences. Previous uh, CRISPR-based editing methods derive their DNA specificity primarily from a single DNA guide RNA hybridization event. In contrast, prime editing actually requires three semi-independent DNA hybridization events in order for prime editing to take place productively. Uh, you need to hybridize the peg RNA to the target DNA site. You need to hybridize the reverse transcribed, um, uh, uh, sorry, you need to hybridize the, uh, the freshly nicked target DNA strand to the primer binding site of the peg RNA. And you need to hybridize the uh, reverse transcribed three prime flap onto the unedited strand of DNA. And since each of these three hybridization events provides an opportunity to reject a mismatched off-target sequence, we wondered if prime editing might uh, offer lower off-target editing levels than, for example, Cas9 nuclease that does not have all three of these checks. And indeed, we examined 16 known off-target sites in the human genome for these four previously characterized on-target guide RNAs. And when we did a side-by-side -side comparison of editing efficiencies of Cas9 nuclease versus prime editors at these off-target sites using the same PEG RNAs to program both nucleases and the base editors, we saw that uh, prime editing uh, showed much lower off-target editing uh, than uh, Cas9 nuclease for all of these off-target sites. And other labs in uh, papers cited at the bottom of this slide have also investigated not just off-target prime editing, but alterations of telomeres, uh, changes to endogenous genomic retrotransposons, alterations of uh, splicing patterns, uh, altered gene expression, using a variety of methods, including single cell uh, whole genome and whole transcriptome analysis, and have found uh, prime editing to be highly specific for the target sequence, with no observations yet reported of undesired prime editing consequences beyond uh, the rare type of off-target uh, editing events uh, shown here. Our labs and several others have recently reported the use of two PEG RNAs to install both DNA uh, strands, edited DNA strands simultaneously, thereby obviating the need for the cell to perform second strand synthesis. Uh, we call this method twin prime editing, uh, which we named after the twin prime paradox, but apparently nobody cared <laughs> because nobody got that. Uh, it's an especially efficient way to uh, perform prime editing of larger DNA sequences, such as uh, the insertion of these uh, roughly 50 base pair at P or at B landing sites for BXB1 recombinase. And you can probably see what's coming next. Now you can uh, use twin prime editing to install a BXB1 recombinase landing site and then use BXB1 recombinase either in a two-step process or in a single transfection process to knock in large multi-kilobase gene-sized DNA at targeted sites of our choosing in the human genome, including at safe harbor loci or at the sites of pathogenic gene loss. And by enabling uh, RNA programmed site-specific insertion of gene-sized DNA in mammalian cells, we're hopeful that this type of strategy might be used to address one of the biggest challenges in therapeutic gene editing, which is that um, most genetic diseases are not like sickle cell disease or progeria, where uh, almost every patient in the case of progeria, and by definition, every patient in the case of sickle cell disease has the same mutation. Most genetic diseases are made of patient subpopulations that are divided into dozens or hundreds of different mutations. And it's challenging to imagine how you could develop a different uh, editing agent drug for each of those mutations. So the best you could probably do if you take that approach is go after diseases where there are significant patient populations that are represented by individual mutations. But if you can install the healthy copy of a gene and the disease is a loss of function, in principle, you could install that healthy copy of the gene at the endogenous locus. So it should be ideally under native endogenous gene regulatory mechanisms. Uh, and rescue um, all patient cohorts that suffer from loss of function mutations, regardless of what their mutation is, not unlike what we did with the SMA mice. Okay, to develop improved prime editing systems, which has been a focus of the lab for the past few years, 
uh, we sought to understand the cellular determinants of prime editing outcomes. And in a collaboration with Professor Britt Adamson at Princeton and Dr. Jeff Hussman in Jonathan Weissman's lab, we use their RepairSeq CRISPR eye screening platform to knock down each of several hundred DNA repair genes in human cells and then measured quantitatively how each perturbation affected prime editing outcomes at a target site that we installed right next to the CRISPR eye guide RNA. So this setup allows the guide RNA and the target site to be read out in a single high throughput sequencing read. Uh, and the strongest single family of hits from this screen were all components of the DNA mismatch repair system. And knocking down these genes, shown in blue, strongly increased prime editing efficiencies and decreased the frequency of undesired indel byproducts. Now these findings support the models shown here for the role of mismatch repair during prime editing. In eukaryotes, mismatch repair resolves DNA heteroduplexes, disagreements between the Watson and Crick strands, by selectively replacing the nicked DNA strands. Since an early intermediate in prime editing is a heteroduplex in which the freshly reversed transcribed strand containing the edit by definition must be nicked, mismatch repair acting on this intermediate before uh, the edited strand can be ligated will likely revert the edit and regenerate the original sequence. So we wondered if we could transiently inhibit or evade mismatch repair during prime editing uh, to enhance prime editing efficiency by allowing this ligation of the NIC a greater opportunity to take place before the heteroduplex can be reverted by mismatch repair. Once ligated, the heteroduplex now lacks any cue to direct mismatch repair as to which strand is at fault, and therefore would be expected to be resolved with roughly equal probability into the edited or the unedited sequence. And of course, in the PE3 systems, we nick the non-edited bottom strand in this cartoon, and that actually biases mismatch repair to, to uh, favor giving us the edited product. Now, to test this hypothesis, we first engineered a dominant negative MLH1 protein that we called uh, MLH1DN, uncreatively. Uh, if you transiently co-express MLH1DN with um, uh, our, either our PE2 system or a PE3 system, uh, you get much higher efficiencies uh, as well as fewer indel byproducts. So we call the combination of PE2 with the mismatch repair dominant negative uh, protein PE4, and likewise the combination of PE3 with MLH1DN we call PE5. Uh, we observe these benefits in many types of cells, including these uh, patient-derived iPSCs in which uh, PE5 efficiently corrected a single base deletion that caused a little girl's uh, CDKL5 deficiency disorder. But what if you don't want, or you can't, perturb mismatch repair during prime editing? You can still use these basic science discoveries because mismatch repair is known to operate primarily on heteroduplexes with small numbers of mispaired bases, one mismatch or two mismatches. We exploited this fact to realize the benefits of MLH1DN, but without having to perturb mismatch repair at all by carefully designing our prime edits to purposefully install additional benign or silent mutations near the target edit so that prime editing intermediates would natively evade mismatch repair because the MMR machinery does not look at such a grossly mismatched intermediate as a mismatch. And indeed, we observed that somewhat counterintuitively, it's actually easier to prime edit to generate multiple edits than it is to generate a single edit because the additional silent or benign mutations near the target edit uh, allow that intermediate to naturally evade mismatch repair. And we now routinely use this strategy to design virtually all of our PEG RNAs, uh, which has uh, substantially benefited prime editing efficiencies. And this advance really just came entirely from achieving a deeper basic science understanding of how prime editing works and how the cell responds to it. And then finally, we optimized uh, codon usage, Cas9 sequences, linker sequences, nuclear localization sequences to generate an optimized prime editing protein architecture that we call PEMAX. And in work I don't have time to present in detail, we also discovered that if you append the critical three prime extension of PEG RNAs with certain RNA pseudonauts, uh, you end up with engineered PEG RNAs, EPEG RNAs as we call them, 
that resist cellular degradation, which turns out to be another bottleneck that previously limited prime editing efficiencies, especially in vivo. And when you combine all these improvements, uh, mismatch repair evasion, the PE max protein architecture, and engineered PEG RNAs, we observe this large cumulative benefit consistent with their independent mechanisms so that our current prime editing systems with EPEG RNAs outperform our original prime editing systems on average by more than an order of magnitude, both in editing efficiency and in the ratios of edits, desired edit to invels. And these advancements have really had a profound impact on our ability to make challenging therapeutic edits, especially in mismatch repair competent cells that used to be poorly edited. It was just sort of a happy coincidence that we developed prime editing in HEC 293T cells, which are naturally MMR, uh, partially MMR suppressed because of a DNA methylation uh, uh, change. Um, and it's tempting to speculate that if we had chosen a cell type to develop prime editing in which mismatch repair was uh, highly active, we may have never actually uh, gotten there. So here are three such examples, all of which uh, started at low single digit percentage prime editing, but thanks to uh, all of the improvements I've talked about, can now be edited at potentially therapeutically relevant levels. Mm -hmm. And in new work I didn't get a chance to present today, we've also used our PACE system to evolve new PE6 prime editor proteins that further increase prime editing efficiencies and also extend the length uh, of prime edits. The ability of prime editing to precisely replace one stretch of DNA with another in a living human cell raises the possibility of correcting the root cause of trinucleotide repeat disorders. Uh, in some exciting uh, new data, still unpublished, we have used prime editing to precisely edit trinucleotide repeats that cause Huntington's disease and Friedrich's ataxia in mouse embryonic stem cells, in Friedrich's ataxia patient fibroblasts, and in vivo in mouse models of both diseases. For both targets, the enhanced prime editing systems I described in this talk can precisely replace larger numbers of repeats at pathogenic loci with non-pathogenic smaller numbers of repeats efficiently and with uh, minimal indel byproducts. Researchers have recently described in vivo prime editing using a variety of viral and non-viral delivery methods. Uh, for example, in work that's publishing uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, our lab achieved in vivo prime editing using uh, iteratively engineered split AAV systems, resulting in therapeutically relevant levels of prime editing in the mouse brain or liver, as well as uh, significant prime editing in the bulk heart. And uh, recent papers have achieved in vivo prime editing in animal models of human genetic disease. For example, Kai Yao's group uh, recently reported the use of AAV delivered prime editing to rescue retinal degeneration uh, in a mouse model of retinitis pigmentosa. And Gerald Schwenk's lab uh, used adenoviral delivery of prime editors to rescue uh, phenylketonuria in mice. In a study we published last week, we used uh, prime editing of sickle cell disease patient uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells to efficiently correct the sickle cell disease, now back to wild type beta globin, because prime editing can make the T to A transversion that's needed to actually convert the sickle allele back to wild type beta globin. And we showed that this can rescue sickle cell disease phenotypes in mice. So 17 weeks after transplantation into immunodeficient mice, uh, prime edited sickle cell disease uh, hematopoietic stem cells showed engraftment frequencies, uh, hematopoietic differentiation, and lineage maturation, not all of which is shown here, that were uh, indistinguishable from those of unedited uh, hematopoietic stem cells from healthy donors, indicating that prime editing did not impair hematopoietic stem cell engraftment or differentiation. An average of 42% of human red blood cells isolated 17 weeks after transplantation of prime edited hematopoietic stem cells into mice uh, showed uh, expression of wild type beta globin exceeding the threshold of about 20% that's thought to confer therapeutic benefit. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the red blood cells uh, from the mice that received the transplanted, prime edited uh, sickle cell patient hematopoietic stem cells uh, carried less sickle hemoglobin and resisted hypoxia induced sickling, uh, shown here. Uh, as we hoped, we detected virtually no off target editing at over 100 sites that were nominated by an unbiased experimental genome wide uh, off target detection method. So while there are several 
uh, several may even be an understatement, many distinct gene therapy and gene editing approaches to treating sickle cell disease that are currently being pursued, uh, these findings suggest the feasibility of a one-time prime editing treatment that offers a unique combination of reverting the pathogenic allele back to the wild-type beta globin without requiring any viral or non-viral DNA templates, which can harm uh, engraftment uh, efficiency, and also minimizes the undesired consequences of uh, DNA double-strand breaks. As is already apparent from what I've presented, the delivery of proteins into animals and human patients remains a major challenge that limits the impact of gene editing and more broadly of macromolecular therapeutics in general. So I'll end this talk with a brief summary of an in vivo gene editing protein delivery platform that uh, I'm particularly excited about. While viral and non-viral uh, approaches each have their strengths and weaknesses for the delivery of gene editing agents, uh, we became particularly interested in virus-like particles. These are basically non-infectious viruses based on retroviruses, like what you heard in uh, Tomas's presentation. Uh, but the viral nucleic acid has been replaced by cargo, ideally cargo protein, and they offer, in theory, some of the best advantages of both viral and non-viral delivery approaches. VLPs can efficiently transduce mammalian cells, in cell culture at least, with specific tissue tropisms that are a function of the glycoproteins that are on the outside of these VLPs, and with no risk of oncogenic DNA integration because there's no viral nucleic acid uh, in, there's no DNA at all in, in the VLPs. Um, they can deliver a one-time dose of a protein or an RNA that's short-lived, ideally uh, for maximizing the DNA specificity of gene editing agents, because gene editing is not equilibrium chemistry. Uh, there's only one or two substrate molecules in every cell. So the on-targets get edited most quickly, and then once the on-targets have been edited, the only thing left in the cell is off-target. So what that means is the shorter you expose the cell to a gene editing agent, as long as you've given it enough time to perform the on-target edit that you wish to make, uh, the higher the specificity, because it won't have as much of an opportunity to edit off-target sites. The challenge with VLPs has been that they've shown low efficacy in vivo, especially for protein delivery, despite the beautiful work of labs like Emiliano Ricci's lab and Jennifer Doudna's lab, who showed that VLPs can deliver Cas9 nuclease efficiently in cultured cells. But when we used these canonical, what we call version one VLP architectures, to deliver current generation base editors, we could achieve very high levels of delivery and editing in cultured cells, but very poor delivery when we injected the same uh, base editor VLPs into animals. So, um, we systematically identified and engineered solutions to three major bottlenecks, which turn out to be cargo release, cargo packaging and localization, and VLP component stoichiometry that reduce the potency of VLP-mediated protein delivery, especially in vivo. And to summarize uh, three years of work uh, from Samagia and Aditya in one slide, uh, we engineered protease cleavable linkers that are cleaved fast enough to allow efficient cargo release in transduced cells, but are slow enough that the cargo is not cleaved prematurely before it can be efficiently packaged into the VLPs, because the cargo can only be packaged from the cytoplasm. Uh, we also solved the paradox of the cargo needing to be in the cytoplasm to be packaged, but in the nucleus to edit genes, where the DNA is, by placing nuclear export signals on the virus side of the cleavable linker, and nuclear localization signals on the cargo side. So as a result, the cargo can remain in the cytoplasm long enough to enable efficient packaging, but once it's cleaved from the VLP, it can, it's free to enter the nucleus. And finally, we vary the stoichiometry of the viral proteins versus the cargo to find an optimal balance between the protease, other viral proteins, and cargo levels that uh, best promotes efficacious delivery. And when we combine all of these improvements, um, we obtained fourth generation engineered VLPs, or version 4 EVLPs as we call them, which mediate much more potent delivery of base editors and Cas9 nuclease into mammalian cells, shown here first in cell culture. Uh, and if you swap the envelope glycoprotein of these EVLPs um, from VSVG to other alternatives, you uh, observe the corresponding uh, alteration of cell type preference of the EVLPs, 
And consistent with the DNA-free nature of EVLPs, we did not detect any cargo encoding DNA in cells treated with EVLPs, unlike cells transfected with plasmids or with, with DNA viruses, suggesting that EVLPs should carry minimal risk of oncogenic gene integration. Now, how do they work in vivo? Well, in contrast with the version one VLPs shown here, these engineered VLPs efficiently deliver base editor RNPs, protein RNA complexes, into tissues in vivo. So a single systemic injection of EVLPs uh, containing base editor protein that's, uh, that is programmed to edit the PCSK9 gene that's in that clinical trial uh, uh, resulted in 63% average editing of bulk liver, which is 26-fold more efficient than the version 1 VLPs. And at 63% editing of bulk liver in a mouse, you've basically edited all the hepatocytes. Uh, and uh, as a result, you get, in this case, about 80% knockdown of serum PCSK9 protein levels, but with no elevated ALT or AST liver enzymes, unlike the use of LMPs, and uh, no liver histology changes. Um, we also uh, injected EVLPs subretinally into a mouse model of genetic blindness caused by a premature stop codon in RP65 and show that injection, this time into adult mice, of an EVLP delivering an adenine base editor protein uh, into uh, the mouse, uh, again, um, can directly correct this mutation back to wild type, rescuing full-length protein production and uh, visual function, uh, which you can see a partial rescue of in, in the animal, uh, as measured by these electro uh, retinograms. Uh, but the real hope is that uh, because VLPs are delivering gene editing agents in their most transient form as proteins that they should show substantially lower off-target editing. And indeed, when we explicitly measure off-target editing at known off-target sites for this base editor and guide RNA, we observe off-target editing following viral treatment, in this case with an AAV, but not following EVLP treatment, even though the on-target editing is comparable for both methods. Okay, so I'll end with a summary of the three classes of gene editing technologies uh, that are programmable and function robustly in mammalian cells. Uh, that is um, nucleases, base editors, and prime editors. Nucleases can efficiently disrupt target sequences, uh, but they generate uncontrolled mixtures of indel byproducts and induce undesired consequences of chromosomal cleavage. Base editors efficiently um, perform the four types of transition mutations without requiring double-strand breaks. But they're vulnerable to bystander editing, which means uh, if a non-target A or C base is located right next to your target A or C base, it can be difficult to distinguish those bases. And at least the earliest version of base editors can also result in Cas-independent deamination of DNA or RNA. The later versions have KMs that are sufficiently uh, weak that they can really no longer bind DNA or RNA in the absence of, uh, of an assistance with uh, uh, with a DNA binding protein. And prime editors can make virtually any type of local edit, again, without requiring double-strand breaks and with high DNA specificity, intrinsically high due to its mechanism. But they are newer, uh, they're larger, and therefore more difficult to deliver, and they're more complex than nucleases or base editors. All three of these technologies have now been validated in animal models of human genetic disease. The first two, as I showed you, have been validated in clinical trials. And together, they really uh, make me very hopeful that one day uh, we may no longer be so beholden to the misspellings in our DNA so that we actually have some say in our genetic fates. Okay, so to summarize, base editing enables the four transition mutations to be installed at targeted sites without requiring double-strand breaks or donor templates. And I showed you how one-time ex vivo or in vivo base editing uh, followed by uh, transplantation in the case of ex vivo editing uh, or just in vivo delivery can uh, rescue sickle cell disease, progeria, and SMA as three examples. Uh, and uh, that prime editing um, enables direct copying of DNA sequence into a chosen target DNA site, thereby enabling you to introduce a wide range of edits into human cells, uh, again, without requiring double-strand breaks or donor DNA templates. And that prime editing, through thinking about the mechanism and, and studying the cell's reaction to prime editors, has been substantially improved. Um, and finally, I showed you how systematic engineering of virus-like particles to overcome specific delivery bottlenecks enables uh, efficient therapeutic in vivo delivery of gene editing agents while minimizing both off-target editing 
uh, and avoiding the risk of oncogenic uh, DNA integration. All right, so um, not too long ago, this is actually the first time this movie has ever been shown, uh, not too long ago, the prospect of, of using laboratory-engineered molecular machines to attend and dictate the development of AAV delivery system editing for base editors. Uh, James Nelson and Peyton Randolph uh, led the development of the engineered PEGRNAs, and Greg Newby, um, Jonathan Yeh, 